It's the late 1980s, and you're a horror movie fan living in the United Kingdom. You go to your local video store wanting to rent something like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but you find that it's not available on the shelves. Why? Unfortunately, films like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre were heavily censored or completely banned during a tumultuous period in the 1980s that's become known as the Video Nasties Phenomenon. Join me as we unravel the complete detailed story of the video nasty, including the main players, the lasting impact, the films that were involved, and this really dark chapter in British cinema history that's left a mark on horror movies forever. To truly comprehend the video nasty phenomenon, we have to go back to the early 1980s when the home video revolution was really transforming the way that we consumed films. The invention of things like VHS technology made it possible for movies to be watched within our own living room, which gave us access to a broad spectrum of films which had never been previously available so easily. As VHS players became a staple in every household, you could now watch movies at home without ever stepping into a theater. This was certainly a game changer, but not everyone welcomed this newfound accessibility. One of the major concerns, which led to the video nasties phenomenon, was basically that kids could get their hands on these films. If these films were in the homes of the British population, what's to stop a five-year-old from putting in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or The Last House on the Left? So while many of these films had been released theatrically and had been widely available, they weren't as accessible. And that was truly the issue that caused the video nasty phenomenon. So to define what a video nasty is, this is a term that was coined to describe a list of horror films that became the focal point of intense scrutiny and controversy across the United Kingdom. These films were often accused of corrupting the nation's youth, and they had either outright bans or severe censorship applied to them. Now, this list of video nasties was far from static. It was constantly evolving evolving and expanding. At its peak, there were over 70 titles on the video nasty list, and most scholars seem to have agreed on a list of 72 that you'll see across the internet. These films were chosen based on either graphic violence, explicit sexual content, scenes of extreme cruelty, or a combination of all of the above. One of the most notorious films of all time, Cannibal Holocaust is really what kicked off the video nasties. In an effort to sensationalize and drive more interest in their film, the creators actually wrote to different conservative groups complaining about their film, acting as a concerned parent or citizen. However, this did backfire and led to some of these conservative groups, which we'll talk about later, leading the charge for censorship. Now, you may think that most of the films on this video nasty list are going to be extreme horror, extreme gore, like Cannibal Holocaust, but that's really not the case. In fact, some very famous horror movies are a part of this list. One that everybody probably knows is The Evil Dead from 1981, directed by the great Sam Raimi. The Evil Dead is one of the most well-known horror movies of all time. It spawned a franchise which has lasted over 40 years with multiple movies and TV shows, but in the context of the Video Nasties era, the graphic violence and gore made it a prime target for censors. The film's low budget and creative use of practical effects made the horror feel shockingly real, which just intensified the moral panic surrounding it. The relentless violence, dismemberment, and scenes of possession led to its inclusion on the list. Another film that made the list was The Last House on the Left from 1972, directed by Wes Craven. The Last House on the Left is far from a family film. It's gritty, it's brutal, it has extreme violence. Both the girls who fall victim to a gang of sadistic criminals and the parents who exact their brutal revenge were just deemed too disturbing for British audiences. Now you're probably thinking, this came out in 1972, how does this play into the video nasties in the 1980s? But this is a great example of how the video nasties list did include movies that had been made years before controversy erupted and it really targeted home video releases. That was the main focus point of the video nasties phenomenon. And finally, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre may be the most well-known film on the list. Toby Hooper's 1974 classic was a controversial entry on the Video Nasties list because 
Although it did have some relentless and raw depiction of violence, it didn't actually have any on-screen gore. Most of it had already been self-censored by the filmmakers to get a release. But the disturbing atmosphere, the rural setting, and the cannibalistic family were just too much for censors. So despite its status as a classic of the horror genre, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre became a lightning rod for critics of graphic violence in cinema. Now, most of the moral panic that surrounded the video nasties was really stoked by sensationalist media coverage. The relentless sensationalist coverage of video nasties by the media played a pivotal role in persuading the government to intervene and impose stricter regulations. This media frenzy was characterized by headlines and stories that depicted the films as a grave threat to the nation's morality and the well-being of its youth. In their coverage, Tabloids and newspapers used provocative language and imagery to amplify public apprehension. Sensational headlines such as killer films invading homes and horror unleashed on innocent viewers dominated the front pages. These headlines, often accompanied by graphic illustrations, painted a frightening picture of the film's content and their alleged impact on viewers. As a result, the public was led to believe that the content of the video nasties was so explicit, so violent, and so morally corrupt that it posed a dire threat to society as a whole. This moral panic not only influenced parents, but lawmakers and the general public as well, who became increasingly concerned about the effects of these films on children and vulnerable individuals. The sensationalist reporting also led to a surge in public debates and discussions about censorship, artistic freedom, and the responsibilities of filmmakers. Many questions whether the government should play a role in regulating what could be viewed in the privacy of one's own home. However, the media and government were not the only ones playing a significant role here. There was also a ton of influence from one formidable campaigner named Mary Whitehouse. Born in 1910, Mary Whitehouse was a prominent figure in the campaign against what she perceived as indecency in the media. She was a staunch advocate for conservative values and believed that the media had a significant role to play in upholding these values. Mary Whitehouse's influence extended far beyond mere activism. She wielded considerable power and influence, particularly within the realm of media regulation. As the head of the National Viewers and Listeners Association, a conservative organization that she co-founded, she spearheaded the crusade against these films. Her relentless lobbying efforts were fueled by a deep moral conviction and a belief that these films posed a severe threat to the moral fabric of society. She was not content to be just a passive critic. She actively engaged with regulatory bodies, politicians, and the general public to advance her conservative agenda. White House's views were characterized by her strong belief in traditional family values, which she believed were under assault by the proliferation of explicit and violent content in the media. She really played a huge role in garnering public support and creating the moral panic around the video nasties. While her supporters argue that she was a moral crusader who tried to protect society from explicit content, critics of her, like myself, just view her as a proponent of censorship and an opponent of free expression and free speech. However, her influence stretched deep at the time and she played a pivotal role in influencing public opinion and politicians, which ultimately led to stricter regulations and the introduction of the Video Recordings Act of 1984. The Video Recordings Act of 1984 stands as a pivotal chapter in the Video Nasty Saga. It marked a turning point in the regulation of films and video releases, fundamentally altering the landscape of the British film industry. At its core, the Act established the British Board of Film Classification, the BBFC, as the sole authority responsible for classifying and censoring videos. Now, the BBFC had been around since 1912, but had previously focused only on theatrical releases. With the Video Recording Act in place, the BBFC's jurisdiction expanded to include video releases, and that meant that every video, whether a mainstream blockbuster or a niche horror film, had to undergo BBFC scrutiny before reaching the public. The BBFC's role was twofold. First, it was tasked with classifying films based on their content, assigning age ratings such as U, Universal, or 18 to indicate the suitability of the content for different age groups. This classification is much like the theatrical classification now from the MPAA, and it was aimed to guide consumers, parents, and guardians in making informed decisions about what films were appropriate for viewing. However, Second, and most significantly in the context of the video nasties, the BBFC was also authorized to censor or in extreme cases outright ban films that were deemed to contain material that was too explicit, violent, 
or morally objectionable. This was a substantial shift in the UK's approach to film regulation as it replaced the prior system where filmmakers could distribute their works without BBFC certification, instead relying on local authorities to make decisions on a case-by-case basis. The Video Recordings Act centralized the process of film classification and it empowered the BBFC to make unilateral decisions that could impact a film's content and availability to the public. For filmmakers, this posed a serious challenge. Many who had been previously able to release their work on video without major interference now found themselves navigating a much more stringent and potentially restrictive system. Many filmmakers faced considerable cuts and alterations to their films in order to secure a certification that would allow their works to reach a wide audience. As a side note, there is a great horror film called Censor, which just came out in 2021 very recently that covers the video nasty phenomenon with one of the characters actually working as a film censor for the BBFC. I highly recommend that if you're at all interested in this time period. Now, the impact of the video nasties controversy spread much further than people not being able to watch movies in their own homes or getting censored versions of the films. For one, this had a serious financial impact on filmmakers and distributors who had their works banned or heavily censored. They would often face substantial financial losses and the investment put into creating and marketing a film could go to waste if it failed to secure a release or had to undergo extensive cuts to meet regulatory requirements. There were also some crazy legal battles, including one directly aimed at the director of Cannibal Holocaust, who was charged with murder murder because authorities believed the actors had actually been killed during filming. The actors had to show up to court themselves to prove that this was just a movie and they had not actually been murdered. So the Video Nasties controversy was not just a footnote in film history, but really a defining moment that changed the way that films were perceived, regulated, and created. It triggered serious debates about the limits of creative expression and the role of censorship in society, debates that continue to resonate today. As we reflect on this chapter of film history, it's essential to recognize the enduring impact of the video nasties. It serves as a reminder of the power of censorship, the complexity of artistic freedom, and the role that controversial films play in pushing the boundaries in our understanding of cinema. The video nasties also have a serious cultural significance that extended beyond its impact on the film industry. I don't think it's any surprise that a satanic panic followed the video nasties controversy in the U.S., in the late 80s and early 90s. And it truly serves as a stark reminder of the power of moral panic, media manipulation, and the potential consequences of unchecked censorship. So thanks for joining me on this extensive journey through the controversial and dark history of the video nasties. If you liked this video and found it informative, make sure to give it a thumbs up, share it with your fellow horror enthusiasts, and subscribe for more in-depth explorations of film history, home video history, and all things movies. As always, stay safe, stay healthy out there, remember to embrace the weird and the wild, and never let anyone censor your passion for the macabre.